Hey gang, very special episode of Real Estate Renegades. Today we are joined by a star of a million dollar listing, but you know what? Let's let him do the intro, let you know what's in store for you on this episode of Real Estate Renegades. Hey, I'm Ryan Serhant, and I cannot wait to hang out virtually with all of you, with Glenn, Naomi. I wanna talk to you about how to build a personal brand, how to close more deals, and I wanna tell you how I'm generating more leads now than ever before, even during this whole pandemic. It's gonna be awesome. Ready, set, go. You want the normal real estate training you've been told a million times, make cold calls, knock on doors, best be switching off now because in this podcast we go out of the box using unknown tactics primarily that the real estate industry has never heard of in order to get you called in more often, convert those listings and get more success without the painful cold call. Listen up, we're in for a ride. This is Real Estate Renegade. This episode, once again, brought to you by agentprospecting.com.au, the service that literally takes that painful task that everyone hates, myself included, of prospecting for new clients, for new appraisals, takes that uh, completely out of your hands, whether it's telemarketing, uh, online lead generation, you'll be handed up to 20, not even at least 20, not up to, at least 20 appraisal leads per month. Just go to agentprospecting.com.au and for a very nominal fee, less than it would cost you to pay your own PA to do it, we'll handle it for you. All right, agentprospecting.com.au. Welcome to Virtual Australia, Mr. Ryan Serhant. Sir, thank you for jumping on. Thank you for having me. Can you can you hear me okay? Oh, perfectly, mate. It is like you are now. How good is this technology where we can communicate like this across the planet? I, I don't think I'm ever going to fly anywhere again for the rest <laughs> of my life. You know, it used to be, and I tell this to my team all the time, like, it used to be that if you wanted to do something just by FaceTime or by Zoom or Google Meets, it almost kind of felt like you were you were cheapening out, right? Like you were you just like you weren't you weren't a professional, right? Because what you can't do it in person now. Now, in years from now, we'd be like, we should do that over Zoom, and you can't say anything back to me because I'll be like, are you you want me to catch a disease? Right? So like, it's ridiculous. But I, I I listen. I appreciate you you having me. I was super excited when you guys reached out. I love Australia. Uh, I love the way you guys sell real estate in Australia. I love everything about. Um, about your country. And I've been there once. I, I did a, a speech a couple years ago, two years ago, I guess. And it was an awesome, awesome time. I actually did a couple speaking things. Um, so I wish I was there, but as do we, sir, you know, you're <laughs> in my new office right now in Tribeca in New York. It's 9 p.m. here. Um, and so all good things. Well, mate, um, we've been, uh, as, as students of yours, I've had so many uh, uh, friends of mine who are students of mine who talk to me about what they've learned from you, not only, uh, you know, from the show and what we see on the show. And by the way, I, I will say, I, I was excited to say uh, my, my co-star in Million Dollar Listing, because sometime back, Josh Altman, when I was working with Josh, put me on the show. He, he drove me around uh, LA for like all morning for about 30 seconds of screen time. I'm like, what you guys Classic. put in? So let's yeah. just say million dollar listing, Glenn Twiddle, my pilot failed dismally. <laughs> That's hilarious. But yeah, um, they film with us a lot and then they'll cut it down yeah. till, you know, to like the, um, a minuscule amount. But, uh, but sir, um, I'm congratulating you on all the successes and I'm thanking you for doing what you're doing for us here today. So I suppose our agenda, and I'm certainly at your whim to change that to whatever you are comfortable with, but we were sort of, um, you know, wanting your insights of some of the highlight reel that you think would be valuable that it, I suppose in exchange for, because I would have loved for this to be an in-room keynote speech that you were offering. And then after that sort of part of it, and for that First part, I'm sitting here pen and paper with notes ready to take. Um, I've got my Sell It Like Sir Hand book there. I am ready to join your Inner Circle coaching program. I can't wait for this to be our debut into that coaching world. And then after that, though, you're going to do us the honor of taking some questions from some of our crew in order to almost personally coach them. So, sir, if you're okay with that, then I'm sitting here uh, as with my student hat on, ready to learn, my man. Yeah, yeah. Listen, let, I think that works well. I think that's a good agenda. So, uh, listen, let's let's get right into it. Love um, it. For those of you who don't know me, and I'm sure probably everyone in here probably does, but if you if you haven't seen Million Dollar Listing New York, uh, that's based here in the U.S., 
I'm a real estate agent in New York City. I've been doing this since 2008, but I wasn't born in New York City. I was born in Texas. Uh, I moved around eight times before I hit fourth grade. Um, the only thing I ever wanted to do when I was a little kid was uh, one, be an actor. Because I thought that was a one place where I would be comfortable on stage because I sucked at sports. Uh, and two, I really like eating. So I was, I was very overweight when I was a little kid. I was terrible at anything athletic. Girls didn't like me. I didn't have a whole lot of friends. I had no I had no self-esteem whatsoever. And being on stage, acting, was the one place I could go to not be myself. Um, and that's where I felt the most comfortable. And that's kind of the career path, if you will, that I took honestly, all the way through college, university, and then going into New York City with no money, but wanting to take a risk and tell myself, listen, I'm going to try this acting thing in New York because I'll regret it for the rest of my life if I don't. And I've got to jump off that, you know, that plank. I've got to jump into the river, right? The river of, of success. Because I, I did, even when I was a little kid, I, I kind of had this idea that we're, we're all on this, this river, right? This river with these rapids and we're all in a raft and success is on that river for all of us. We just don't see it because it's either really, really far down the river or it's behind a bend or it's behind a tree and you got to nail it with your raft or you got to go up against a bunch of rapids or maybe your river is super chill and super easy because you invented Facebook and you IPO'd and you made a couple billion dollars slash a hundred billion dollars. You know, I, all of us have that in front of us that we just have to keep paddling. Um, and that's something that I knew when I was a little kid. And it's what I, I thought about when I first came to New York. And then the acting thing didn't work out whatsoever. Total, total colossal shit show. Uh, uh, I made no money, barely got any work, and then ran out of money in 2008. And uh, actually, 12 years ago was my first day in real estate as an agent. It was the day in New York, in the US, that Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy and the global recession uh, was sparked, right? From the housing crisis and the whole world fell apart. That was my first day. Yeah, good that timing. Day. <laughs> good timing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was the day that I got in. I had khaki pants, cowboy boots, a collared shirt. I had no idea what I was doing. I wasn't from New York. The only things I knew about the city were a handful of streets where I would go to like auditions, you know, to do hand model auditions. That's actually where I made the most money those first two years in New York City from 2006, 2008. I would hold cell phones and they would take photos of my hands. I'll show them to you now. I, this is way better than me being Australian because I can be so close. I would see, look at these hands. There's no freckles or anything. And look how big that wedding ring is now, by the way, total non sequitur. This is a mini handcuff, just FYI. That's what the Greeks do. It's like, ah! anyway, that's where I made my money. Uh, and hand, hand modeling doesn't pay, uh, doesn't pay forever. And so I had to get a job and I had a friend who said, you know what, all the memorizing, all the acting, all the improvisations that you did, you know, in school, all the stuff that you had to learn how to breathe, how to talk to people, how to understand different conversations coming out of it from the blue. That's real estate. That's selling real estate. You should be a real estate agent. And my initial thought was absolutely not. Selling real estate has got to be the worst job in the world. The last thing I'd ever want to be, are you kidding me, is a realtor. Realtors don't have money. They just work for people. Realtors are glorified waiters. It's, I, you can, I, I, it was like, it was as if you had told me you're going to be a garbage man and you're going to make a lot of money. That's what I thought real estate agents were. Because I think I had this idea in my head. And if you went around New York City, you had people that were very unprofessional as real estate agents and they were liars, you know, kind of like beat up, dirty, kind of a cliche, kind of snake oil car salesman. And then you had people who were really old like just very old, you know, second, third career. That was it in New York. Those are the two types of brokers. And I was 22, 23, saying, I, I don't fit into either of these, but what am I doing here? And my friend said, well, you could sell because you know how to act. I'm like, dude, I had one sales job in my whole life, okay? When I was 10 years old, I started a company uh, called Jack Ryan Wood, okay? Outside Boston in Massachusetts, uh, my parents had bought a house when I was a little kid. And the house they bought had a lot of land 
and it had a lot of trees. And my parents started cutting down those trees to make yards for us to play in and so they could see and stuff like that. And all these trees were just being chopped up and carted off. And I saw at a grocery store one day that people were actually selling wood, like for firewood. And they were selling it by the cord. That's what they called it, a cord of wood, right? They'd sell it that way. And I thought, wait a minute, my dad's chopping down all these trees at home and I think he's giving them away. Holy shit, I'm sitting on a bunch of inventory. I could sell this stuff. I really wanna buy a video camera because that's all I wanted in the whole world was to get my own video camera when I was 10 years old. Uh, and I went to my parents and I said, instead of giving all that wood for free, could I sell it? And, and I wanna make a business. And they kind of were like, uh, sure, what are you gonna call it? I was like, my little brother will do it, Jack. And like, Did you talk to Jack? Jack seven, I'm like, Jack will do it. Jack does anything I say. So we created a little business. My dad gave me a little bit of cash to put into a newspaper and we created Jack Ryan Wood. Uh, and we put out ads. And we got a phone call from this guy who said, I saw your ad, I'd like to buy two cords of firewood. And I'm telling you, I remember that call like it was yesterday. I remember that call better than all the calls I had today. Okay. And I was 10 years old outside Boston. And all I remember in my head was, I'm going to be rich. This is it for me. I'm going to sell firewood for the rest of my life. I'm going to buy like a thousand video cameras. I put one ad in the newspaper. I got a call to sell two cords of wood. That's insane. Now, I didn't do my research and I didn't really figure out how big a cord is. Okay. A pickup truck fully filled can fit maybe half of one cord of wood. I know this now. And so I'm 10 and now I realize that's a, that's a ton of wood that I got to cut. Anyway, my little brother and I, we chop all this wood. You know, my dad just gives it to us. We chop it all. And then we don't know how to deliver it. The guy wants it delivered. There's a guy that's working on our property, helping with all this stuff. His name is Biff. He drives a big red pickup truck. I ask him if he'll help us. He says, sure, okay, whatever. He's kind of a weird guy. We load up the first half cord. We take it to the customer. The customer comes out and says, please drive it down my driveway, which is the longest driveway I've ever seen. And please stack it. And we're like, okay. Biff says, that's not part of the deal. I'm like, Biff. You're an older man. I'm 10. My brother's seven. Could you please help us? And he says, fuck this. This wasn't the job. He unloads all the wood on the side of the road and drives off and leaves me and my little brother on the side of the road. This is my first deal I've ever done in my whole life, my first sale in the history of the world. Uh, I had no idea what to do. And the customer looks at us and says, well, you're going to have to clean this up and figure this out and leaves us on the middle of the road. And we're little kids. And so I don't know what to do. So I put my little brother in a bush and I hike home. It's like two miles. 10. I get home. I tell my parents what happened. And the first thing they said, and I thought they were going to like, maybe feel better and come help me. They said, where's your brother? I said, it's okay. I hit him in the side of a bush on the side of the highway. It's, it's fine. He's fine. That didn't go so well, but my dad grabbed me. We went back there and he watched as I with a wheelbarrow picked up all that wood and drove it, uh, sorry, and wheelbarrowed it to the guy's front porch and laid it all out there and stacked it neatly because as I was always told when I was a little kid, it's all about setting expectations with your parents, with your friends, with yourself and with your customers. You gotta set expectations and you gotta live up to your word. If you, I have this thing that I say all the time, the three Fs, follow up, follow through and follow back. That is how, I, that's my secret sauce. That's how I live my life. It's part of the course, part of the book. I'm not gonna go into it in super heavy detail here because it would get very, very, very intense. But follow through, is, it's gotta be in your bones. You have to do what you say you're gonna do. And I knew that even when I was 10 years old. And then the customer looked at it and said, well, this isn't all the wood. And I said, yes, I know there's so much, but I know I don't have a truck, I, I, I'm sorry. I don't know what to say. I'm very, very sorry. This, my, the whole thing was just a colossal shit show. And he said, you know what? I'll arrange for a pickup, but I want half off. If I've got to do the pickup and the delivery, I want half off. And initially in my head, I'm like, Psh, I'm not selling my wood for half. It's, I'm, a, I'm a wood broker. This is what I do now. I'm like starting a wood empire. Like a brokers today who are like, I'm not a discount broker. I don't cut my commissions. There's no FBI here. There's no like police, right? I made up this price and stuck it in the paper. So in the back of my head, I'm also saying, you know what? I'd rather have half than zero. Because if I just walk away and argue, then I'm just gonna get zero. So I agreed. We had the rest of the wood chopped up. He came, he picked everything up. And the next day I was like, you know what? 
I could wake up on one side of the bed and I'm going to go back into this business and sell more firewood than anyone in the world, or I'm going to quit because sales sucks and I hate stupid firewood. And that's exactly what I did. So that was the last sales job I ever had. And it was a terrible experience. And it really, really ingrained in me a lot of things about customers, about follow through, about setting expectations, about doing your research and really understanding your market and understanding your product and what you're going to sell. So when my friend said, you should get into real estate and sell apartments to crazy people in New York City, my mind went, dude, I couldn't even sell firewood to sort of crazy people in Boston 13 years ago. I don't want to deal with someone who has millions of dollars in their bank account. Like, have you ever met someone who has millions of dollars in their bank? They're lunatics. They're crazy people. They have high demands. They're way too specific. And most of them are assholes. I don't want to deal with that kind of person. Terrible. Why would I ever do that? But my back was up against a wall. And I didn't have anything else to do. I was, I was either figure out how to pay my rent and pay for food and live my life in New York City or move home. And as scary as New York can be, especially now, as scary as it can be, there is something so terrifying about it and how threatening the city can be to your livelihood that makes it exhilarating, that actually pushes you. And that's something that I've always called my wall. Right? I talk about my four W's a lot. Those four W's are really, really important to figure out. And I ask every student that works with me, every course member around the world, there's over, almost, I guess, almost 5,000 of us now, um, uh, my entire team, you got to figure out what your four W's are. And I think the most important W there is what your wall is so that you know when you wake up and you're tired and the baby's screaming or you didn't sleep well, you know what you're fighting for. And for me, when I got into the real estate business, I was fighting for rent. I had to figure out how I was gonna pay $1,100 a month in rent, okay? And my first year, I made just over $9,000. I think it was like 9,188 was on my tax return. Um, that's poverty, okay, by definition. But I was still young, I, like, I didn't put two and two together. And the hand jobs, my, sorry, the hand modeling <laughs> worked really, really well for me. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, and I was able to hold a lot of phones and still get, I got paid more as a hand model than I ever did as a real estate agent my first two years in this business because I would get paid 150 bucks an hour holding phones. And I have really I have big hands and I could really grit anyway. Um, and that was my entry into the real estate business was then meeting clients on the street at coffee shops and having no shame because my back was up against a wall and I didn't know what else to do. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of amazing that I find myself where I am today, but what I fell in love with is selling, to be honest, I fell in love with the idea of the chase and of the game, right? This game that we all play as real estate agents is the game of attention. It's not a real estate game to me. It is the real estate's there, unless you're a developer or a contractor or a plumber, like the real estate is being built by somebody else. You can invest in deals. That's all fine. But that's not what we're here to talk about. Real estate is a piece of that game. And I am here to get as much attention in the game as possible. And the more attention you have, the more influence you have on sales. That's really, 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 really important. And I, and I want to come back to that in a second. But I, I love sales. Actually, you know what? I love how you all sell. In Australia. You know, when I first came to Australia and I was talking to a lot of the different agents and they were so amazed when they watch Million Dollar Listing New York at how we price property. They're like, wait a minute, you let the seller pick the price. You as the agent then spend all the money on marketing, all the time and effort. You'll keep it on the market for six months, a year, three years of your life. You don't make anything. You get yelled at every day and maybe it sells. And all you're trying to do is get some offer that's lower. And then you're going to try to bridge a gap with furniture or like, or expenses or closing. Oh, terrible. And I remember standing there and I think I was in Sydney. It's like, wait, 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 that's not how you do it. I did not know that there was another way. <laughs> Please explain to me. And I got walked through this amazing platform called the auction model mm. that is mostly used, 
um, um, in Australia, I, pretty, pretty singularly, and it blew my mind. So it's like, you know, that's a way that you can create a marketplace. Now, I know you have laws and rules now where you can't set a reserve price that is so far and away from what you can accept. And there's a lot of different ways to police your system. Otherwise, people could really, really, really abuse it. You know, because in my mind, I'm like, oh, $10 million property. I'll, I'll, I'll reserve $1 million. Let's get 1,000 people there and I'll bid it up to some sucker, right? Can't do that, apparently. But I left Australia and I came back and I told myself, you know what? I love that model. I'm doing that in New York. So I had a townhouse actually uh, at 337 West 87th Street uh, that was listed initially at $16 million, sat on the market for a year. I then got the listing and priced it at 14. Sellers were brutal, so mean. Like they would call me on the phone and they'd ask me, Ryan, do me a favor. I know you're probably busy. How do you, how do, how do you pronounce uh, F-A-I-L? I remember that phone call so clearly. And I was like, how do I pronounce fail? Oh, that's oh, how you pronounce shit. it. I'm not failing. I'm doing everything I possibly can, Bob. And they were so tough. But we priced it then at 12. And they got to a point where they really needed to sell. And they said, listen, we must sell this house. $10 million is our number. You got to get us 10. Like there's, I, everyone in New York City is looking between five and, and 15 million. Being priced at 12, it is so hard to find someone who's going to come through to make an offer. There's so much inventory. There's years and years of inventory sitting on the market in New York City back then and now because of this process in which we sell homes here. And so I said, you know what? I just came from this amazing place. It's called Australia. I don't know if you've ever heard of it or been there. They do this thing and we're going to do it here. We're going to auction this house. And in New York, auction means bankruptcy, right? It means you suck. It means you couldn't do it. You had to lower the price. The bank is taking it back. Murder yourself. And I had to explain it to him how it's going to work and how we're going to do it and how we're going to create the game and how it's a game of attention and how the intention influenced sales. And I convinced them and I said, you want 10 million? We need to set the reserve price at six and a half. Okay. Now I know that that's really far. Okay. But good thing auctions aren't, aren't a thing here and I could just do whatever I want. And so what I said was, I'm going to figure out how to get this to 10 million. We're going to price it at six and a half. And what it's going to do first and foremost is it's going to freeze the marketplace. We're going to be the only people doing it. And so in the MLS, which is the, you know, the, the public listing system here, all these other houses out there between seven and $20 million, or all of a sudden going to see a house that was 16 million go down to six and a half. And we're going to tell people that we're going to have one week of previews. And then on Sunday, we're going to take the best bids, right? In our own way. And everyone, and no one had any idea what we're doing. It was so weird and so crazy. And the sellers hated me because all of a sudden all their friends and all the brokers that they had met over all the years started emailing them and saying, what the fuck are you doing? You lowered the price to six, you idiot. What, Sir Hint brainwashed you. Don't believe what you see on TV. It's those teeth or whatever the hell they say. <laughs> like, and so they got, they were so upset. The minute I did it, they're like, fix it, fix it. Change it back, change it back, change it back. I'm like, I can't, we're, we're in it now. Let's just see what happens. If we don't get a good price, I will raise the price back up. It's fine. We had, uh, I want to say 82 people through in that week when we had averaged maybe one a month before wow. that. Uh, the elevator in the townhouse broke. The fire department had to show up. People were stuck in line outside because for the first time in that market, and this was years ago, all of a sudden there was a prime property on the Upper West Side of New York City that was a deal. It was listed as a deal. And what worked well for me was that everybody got it. Everyone knew what I was doing. Everyone knew, especially when they saw everybody, that we weren't selling this for six and a half. I needed to create a market for it. And so I did. And we had a bunch of people who offered five, six, six and a half, seven, and one person was eight. And we had one person of those 82 who came to us and said, listen, I'm sure you're getting tons of offers. Well, you know, over all the prices, we love this house. We saw that it was listed for 16. It was just way too much for us, even at 12. So we never came and saw it before, but now we're so confused. And I don't know what's going on, but our number's 10. If we could get it for 10, we'd buy it for 10, but we're probably not gonna get it. 
and we sold it for $10 million to those wow. people. Did you and, do the auction uh, in the rooms like is traditional here where we have these 82 people or did you do it uh, sort of um, privately, no. but through the auction method? Privately through the auction method and they had mm. to send us emails by a certain time ah. with attorney information and proof of funds. Right. And I remember that day and that was probably one of the most exciting days I've ever had in real estate because it was activity and it was like blood flow and adrenaline and people were calling, people were angry, people were fighting and I loved it. I loved it. Talk about building brand. I was so loud with that sale process for that one house. And like I, I sell 500 houses a year here. That one house with the way that we sold it, all of a sudden created my brand. And people started calling me to start auctioning property. And then I got into a problem because it worked on that house because we went from 16 to six and a half and ended at 10. But then I had people calling me with shitty properties, <laughs> terrible properties, overpriced properties. And they're like, and people who also weren't motivated to sell. We said, yeah, okay, yeah, drop it to whatever you want, but I'm not selling for a dollar under 5 million. I'm like, yeah, but it's not, it's, it's only worth three. This doesn't work. And so then the auction model started to catch on. People started to do it and it didn't work. And it started really confusing the marketplace. And so we eventually, we just had to stop because there wasn't a good platform for it here. And New Yorkers are <clears throat> equal, equally the greediest and uh, are you the greediest and also the most jealous people in the world. Like they will, they will overpay if they feel like they're going to lose something, but they will also negotiate the price of a carrot. Like <laughs> they are that stingy, but it was interesting because it created my brand and your brand, right? Is your reputation. My reputation at that time, having come back from Australia for a good period of time was a guy who can auction property. And I tried to run with it. Now, it didn't stick with me for a long time because the auction model doesn't, like I said, doesn't really, really work here. But it stuck with me for a long enough period of time that I was able to build a bunch of different listings from it. And what I realized was <clears throat> it wasn't just the auctions. It was the fact that it worked. It was success. And success begets success. So whether it's the auction model on that house on 87th Street or a sale over here, I need to scream all of my successes from every mountaintop I possibly can, because that's the only way people are gonna call me and I need to differentiate myself. People didn't call me and reach out to me and give me business because I sold 87th Street over ask or under ask. No, they called me because I was doing it differently, right? And so like, what I also learned there is that I had to direct the deal. You know, a lot of agents came before me and a lot of agents come before me on a lot of properties. and. They, they blame the seller, they blame the market. I always come into every deal that I do just like that one. And I look at it as I'm not a broker, I'm a director. I'm gonna direct a movie. All of the clients, all of the parties involved, all of the different prospects, all of those people are the actors in the movie. And I'm gonna direct them. And because I'm the director, I know how this movie is going to end. And it's gonna end with a deal. And I am going to direct all of these players to do exactly what I want to do. And a lot of times, and if you look, you're, we're in my office right now, I've got booklets and papers everywhere. Mm -hmm. I will actually sit down and script out how I think the deal is going to work. If it's a difficult deal, you don't have to do this type of work if it's easy. If you get something that's priced right, it sells tomorrow, great. That's your base salary because you are supposed to sell it because it sold itself. Everything else, that's your bonus right? That's what you're made of. That's how you define yourself. That's what I realized that I had to direct. So I would map out, okay, this is how I'm going to pitch the listing. And this is how I'm going to get the deal done. This is where the seller wants it. This is where I think buyers are going to come in. And then we're going to get over here and I'm going to figure out how I'm going to get to the price that it's actually going to sell for. And that's how I'm going to dictate how this deal gets done. And I'm not going to tell either of them where I think the deal gets done because you've got to watch the movie before you get to the end. And it works almost every time because you know how they talk about the power of positive thinking? If you imagine the price the house gets sold for and you imagine the excitement around the sale, I'm telling you, more often than not, you're gonna get that home sold because you projected it happening. And you're gonna project it happening at that particular number. And you're negotiating people together. Same thing like that house. Like, I wasn't the only broker that came in and told those sellers to adjust the price. 
I just came in with the strategy and a different cast of characters for a different movie for the same exact property. And I came in and I decided what the end game was going to be because they kind of told me they wanted to sell for 10. And so I just had to figure out how to get everybody together to make the film that I wanted to make. Right. And now I lead a team. So I lead a large team. We have 62 people. I've now been in this business, like I said, for 12 years. Tom, well, you today, me tomorrow. Um, and now my business is very much about taking the brand that I built, which now is luxury high-end real estate agent. I sell new development condominiums and resales, and I sell them all over New York City and other cities throughout, throughout the country. And now we sell things all over the world, given our course and the referral network that's in there, which is just craziness. Um, but I, I generate leads all day. Like if you ask me, Ryan, what do you do all day? Do you film all day? Do you show? Like, what do you do? My job all day long as a real estate salesperson, because that's really what I am, I'm more, I'm more of an agent than I am a manager or anything else, is to generate leads. That's it. That's my job. My career is as a broker. The work is showing, negotiating, photos, videos, all the stuff that I do to build my brand. But the actual job is to generate leads. And what was amazing about quarantine and COVID-19, you know, and New York was shut down for, I mean, we were shut down for like 100% for March, April, May, June, for three months of like, of zombies here. You could walk up the middle of Fifth Avenue and see zero people. It was wow. the most insane thing for three months. Craziness. I walked down, like, you, I, I have so many photos in my phone. It was like a movie set. You walk through Times Square and there's like paper just drifting. No one was here because foreigners couldn't get here. Everyone was too nervous and people were quarantined inside their homes. And so I had to figure out how do I lead a team from home, stuck in our apartments, uh, in a job that is all about generating leads when we can't actually go and show the apartments. Now, I had set up a media company three years ago, not predicting a pandemic, but knowing that more and more people go to YouTube and go to video to search for homes now than they actually do on search engines like Google. And video sells more than anything. And people that don't embrace video today are going to be are the people who didn't embrace the internet in 1995. Like those are the people who are like, nah, that's not real. That thing is, that's just stupid. And they're gonna be left behind. So I set that up three years ago. So we were good on the virtual showings front, but where I had a hard time figuring out was how to generate leads. So I came up with something called the three, five rule and it's worked with for me since March. And it works for my entire team and it should work for all of you as well. And what it means is, it's a, it's a to-do list, okay, that every day you have to reach out to 15 people in three separate ways. Because it used to be to me that I got to meet a certain amount of people. I got to meet five people a day, five people a day, five people a day. But then I would get confused about, okay, well, I met two people on the street. I got to do, I don't know, should I call them? What do I do? So this, I'm stuck at home, right? So you can do this from home because it's what we did for three months. We didn't get released from home until June 22nd. The three, five rule is reaching out to 15 people today that you otherwise would not have reached out to. And you can do it by email, text, and phone. Or tomorrow it would be text, phone, direct message. Or tomorrow it can be through LinkedIn and then phone and then five letters. Whatever way you wanna communicate, the choice is yours. Break them up into three with five people in each of those three groups. And I'm telling you, it takes no, no more, no more than 45 minutes. Maybe an hour if you, if you wanna call 15 people and they all talk to you. And all you're doing is you're reaching out to all of them and saying, hey, just thinking about you, just wanna check in, make sure you're okay, let me know if you need anything. Super simple, no bullshit, no checking in to see if you wanna sell or rent, no market reports, no I just sold this, just sold that. You're just checking in on them which no one ever does. And it's especially effect effective when it's on the phone. If you call up someone and they pick up, hey man, just wanna see how you're doing. Pe no, like, people are like, what do you mean? The amount of people who are like, I don't get it. What do you want? I'm like, I, honestly, I haven't talked to you since that closing two years ago. I just, I, I'm sorry. I just wanna check in and see how was the year? Like, what do you, what do you, how are you generating, like, what are you doing? And you'd be amazed how much people then open up to you 
and it generates business. We got a $30 million penthouse listing in Tribeca from one of those calls to an attorney I haven't seen or talked to, my bad, in three years. And we got so much business from it that we've been lining up now because we can actually go out and show and sell and move around. Because I reached out and actually showed people that we cared. I'm like, why haven't I been doing this the entire time? I can do this from home. I don't have to go to Starbucks. I don't have to go to that restaurant. I, I will do that once those things open back up again in the US and New York specifically. But for now and during quarantine, there's so much we can do to build our brands and to generate leads, which is our job from our couch. And it's just about touching base and showing people that you care. And quarantine was a great time for, for me and my team to grow our networks and start new businesses. I mean, I wrote a book, I met new people. And then it works if you can structure your day, right? And your day has to be structured as such. And I talk about this in the course and in the book. And it's how I, even if you look at my calendar right now, <clears throat> I don't know how to take the camera out of my computer and show you, but <laughs> I structure my day according to something I call finder, keeper, doer. FKD, get fuck, fucked. There's no, there's no you, <laughs> but get FKD, finder, keeper, doer. So my day is structured every day since 2011, I want to say, in those three phases, because I'm an entrepreneur, right? I'm a 1099 contractor. I sell homes. No one pays me a salary. I don't get health benefits. I got to wake up every day and be the CEO, CFO, COO of my own life, of my own business. So how do I do that? And I didn't know how to do that in 2011. I, it's my first job I've ever had other than Jack Ryan Wood and holding phones. Like, what do I do? So every morning, the first two hours of my morning, and this can be flexible, obviously, appointments come first, right? But if you have nothing to do, or you just have an appointment at three, or you, you feel lost, and most of us can feel lost all the time, you structure the beginning of your day first two hours as the finder. That's the time where you actually focus and you sit there and you find new business. You think about yourself the way a head of a company would, the president would, the CEO, the, the chief would. How, how, did, how does the coach think about their football team? You use those two hours and you put your brain to work. I'm telling you, your brain is capable of doing a lot when you allow it to versus when you're running around all day long doing busy work and then looking back at your life in a year or two or 10 and saying, I don't have a whole lot to show for it, but damn, was I busy. Busyness is a crutch. It's a crutch we all hold on to. It's like going to the gym to do the same exercise every single day. It does jack shit for you because then you go home, you eat like crap, but guess what? I went to the gym, I worked out, I did the work. You didn't do the work because you didn't think about it in a smart way. And you didn't try to change the system. And the system is your day. Beginning is finder finding business, being that chief. And then the middle part, okay, maybe just for an hour, is the keeper. The keeper is the one who focuses on the math and the numbers and the advertising and the marketing budgets. It's important for you to know how much money you have in the bank and how much you can spend every single day. So all those genius ideas you just came up with as a finder, now you have to execute on them and figure out how you're gonna pay for them. Do you have an ad budget with your brokerage? Do you have spending cash? Is it dinners that you're gonna do for clients? Are you gonna buy everyone a pumpkin in October? What are you going to do, right? It's gonna be summer in a couple months. How are you going to market yourself that way? Maybe you're gonna be the one who gives out branded surfboard, whatever your thing is, right? In that keeper time, you focus on that, like the CFO of your own company, because it's important to be in tune with yourself that way. And then the rest of your day, you're the doer, you're the COO, you're the back office, you're showing, you're painting, you're running around, you're then doing all the things that the finder and the keeper actually set up to do. And you tie that process in with good follow-up and accountability, the three fives that we just went through, and you set good goals for yourself, and not just sale goals, income goals, right? I don't understand how agents always say, well, I want to sell a billion dollars. I'm like, okay, how much money do you want to make? And they're like, whatever a billion dollars gets me. I'm like, okay, well, figure out how much money you want to make to survive. Figure out what the growth is. And then back out the math that way to figure out how much you need to sell based on an average commission and your average split. Anything above that is bonus. 
That's your base salary and that's how you're gonna figure out your life. So you're gonna find your keeper doer every single day. You're gonna generate leads with the three, five rule. You're gonna follow up, follow through, follow back with everybody and do what you say you're gonna do. And all of that is gonna build an amazing brand of accountability. That's then a hard worker. That's someone who sets expectations. That's someone who clients are excited to talk to because they've got their shit together. And so many of us, and I'm sure a lot of us right now, are, are not those people who have their stuff together and they really, 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 really want to be. And that's, that's the sauce there. That is, that is how you put it all together. And at the end of the day, like I said at the beginning, we are all on a, a river of success. We just don't know where the success is. It's around that bend, it's under that rock. And sometimes if we get lucky and we paddle hard enough and you don't get out of the boat and take your boat home, because it's easier and cheaper and you just keep fucking paddling, the river eventually is gonna lead you to success and, and it's not over because every river ends in the ocean, every single one. And the ocean is where it gets super exciting because it is crazy scary, but you have so many more options. And you don't have to deal with waterfalls and all those things. Now you just got sharks, right? Now you got sharks and storms and bigger things, but that's okay. Because at the end of the fucking ocean, where do you hit? Like every other good retired person, you land on the damn beach. And why don't we open it up to questions from there? I feel like questions now. I love it, bro, man. I got two pages of notes there, mate, myself. And there was so much commonality between what I heard from you and our best students here in Australia and our best practitioners um, that, that have done this. I love it, mate. So I've got a few questions, but we've also got some from our folks. So Gnomes, do you want to throw on Adrian? Um, this fellow here, uh, Adrian Bow. there he is. This is Adrian. He is literally- Adrian. Um, Robert, how are you, my man? As good as they you? get, my man, this guy, he got out of high school into real estate and has not left. So he is a veteran and a beast. And, um, mate, I had to introduce you guys because, uh, uh, you know, we never stop learning. And Adrian, whilst he coaches a bunch of us around Australia, um, as nice. a student, he's without peer as well. So I'll let you guys have a quick yarn with Adrian's question. Yeah, hey, dude, mate, massive fan, Ryan. So uh, appreciate uh, sharing your journey on uh, Million Dollar. It's uh, entertaining and, uh, and certainly from a practitioner point of view, certainly a lot of value add as well. So, mate, I was Thanks. just listening in and, um, you know, I know pivot is a bit, a bit cliche given uh, COVID, but obviously during the lockdown, as you said, rather than just calling and asking for business, you're literally just touching base with people and checking in. Um, has that carried through now? I know we're not fully post COVID, but we're certainly in that transition phase. So is there yeah. anything for you that you implemented similar to that, that got you a $30 million listing that you're now going to perpetually implement into your business going forward? Well, the three, five rule for sure. And that was something that we just kind of developed during COVID because we were stuck at home on the couch and, and it was kind of just by envy a little bit. Like I, I started reading about all the people that created businesses and changed the world in recessions and pandemics. You know, everything from, you know, the sport of basketball to the guitar, like all these things that came up during really, really down times. You know, like gravity was founded during a pandemic. Like it's just, it's, it's, like it was just crazy. And so that has carried over for sure. But a lot of the work that we've been doing since New York opened, has been handling a lot of that inflow that came from three months of reaching out to 15 people a day. And that, that was me, like I did 15 and then I have a whole team. And I think they did it, I wasn't there with them. They say they did, they've been pretty busy ever since with you know good clients, uh, but that's, that's kind of carried over. But other than that, we haven't really had to pivot too much. You know, we, we stayed working um, and we were in New York for the most part. My team was still here. We don't give up on the city. Uh, we didn't leave like a lot of people. Uh, you know, some of our things are virtual now. I gotta wear masks when I show and gloves and the whole thing and can't touch people anymore, but that's kind of okay. I didn't really like touching people in the first place. 
but it's just really cool to know that not just by asking for the business, but simply checking in on people. Because as agents, Ryan, as you know, we can be talking heads to clients. We're like, oh, you know, we had three people through or what do you think of the property? And like, rarely do we actually pause momentarily and say, hey, how are you doing? How are you feeling? How's the process going for you? So I think that's yeah. a really good takeaway, man. The other, well, the other thing- what I'll, what I'll say, sorry, not to cut you off, but yeah, so man. I don't forget, it's, you know, one of the things they teach you when you're when you're acting so in acting school and i learned this at the the at the globe theater where i, I did uh shakespeare in london when i was in college um because the language is not normal right yeah. it's 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 tricky to learn and it, like you you memorize shakespearean dialogue like you would a poem um and a great prof a great teacher there and a great actor said you need to learn to listen to people, yeah. to respond to them, and not to listen to them to reply. Because if you listen to them to wait for your line, to respond with what your line is gonna be because you're not listening to understand what they're truly saying, then it's gonna feel, it's gonna be bad acting. It's not gonna look good. It's gonna be inauthentic, it's gonna look terrible. And that always stuck with me. And it goes the same for clients and people today, right? You, so like you just said, so many of us are talking heads. We call up somebody because we want to talk to them about real estate mm -hmm. and we listen to their sob story about their dog or their kid or this, that. And we're like, oh, crazy, crazy. Anyway, blah, 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 blah. And yeah. you don't build relationships that way. And then people don't like you. Like if people aren't calling you back, you need to take a hard look in the mirror and maybe record yourself while you have phone conversations and listen to how you sound when you talk to people. Are you listening to, are you, are you listening to respond to what they're saying? Or are you listening to reply with what you want it to say? It's a very, very important distinction for salespeople to understand. And it was, it was huge for me. Um, and I think everybody should record million dollar listing. What it did for me in the beginning uh, was, show me how terrible I am at a lot of things on a national level. And then everyone on Twitter reminded me of it. Like <laughs> you want to have a good mirror into your life, put yourself on TV. Like it is. And I realized what I was doing and it, and I fixed things. Like, so season two changed up a little bit, season three, season four, so on and so forth. Um, so I think everybody should use cameras and phones to like, it, just monitor your business and how you operate your business and how you talk to people. If you're not closing enough deals, it might just be in the way you talk. Yeah. Awesome, man. Hey, so a big buzzword at the moment is, you know, what's your purpose? What's your why? You've got Simon Sinek talking about it and obviously a lot of other, um, you know, people in the industry. Uh, so, I mean, you know, the authenticity that you show, you know, from day one, when I started watching season one, right up until now, you know, you had that drive and that passion and that discipline. But would it be fair to say, since you've had a family, um, that's just exploded, you know, because now you've got, you know, obviously a beautiful wife and another human being that you've brought into the world. Um, you know, discipline is difficult to maintain. Motivation is easy to get you started. Would you say, without trying to sound cliche, that that is your purpose and that is your why at this stage? Yeah, yes. I mean, I, I, in the, I, I will always take care of my family. And I think they're pretty lucky to have me as a dad, if I'm being honest, like they lucked out, you know what I mean? Like life could have gone a lot worse. Um, I, I feel massive responsibility to my team um, and to my clients and the people who hire me, who put their investments in my hands. Like I, it keeps me up at night. And that's something that I still have to work on to really try to detach myself personally from, from the job. But at the same time, my my personal attention to the work is what brings me more business because people know that i actually give a shit and i actually care like this isn't just about numbers for me like the most important quote in my entire life is if you take care of the work the work will take care of you and you can't take care of work like just but just by doing it like you actually got to take care of it and care about it and care about clients and that's how you're going to get price reductions. That's how you're going to get deals done. That's how you're going to negotiate. Clients are going to negotiate with you because they like you and they understand where you're coming from and they trust you, not because you told them to. So like, it's about finding that fine line. Yeah.
Got it. The other thing is, which you were really accurate in, in uh, summarising the way we do business in Australia, it, it, it certainly seems a lot simpler. Um, for us, obviously, we've got to find the sellers. That's a big uh, main pillar for us. I mean, you guys get the luxury of acting as buyers, agents and sellers agents. Um, what advice would you give to agents who really 80% of their focus is trying to identify people that want to list real estate, you know, like apart from the obvious lead generation uh, techniques, what, what tips would you give the listeners? So there's a lot. I mean, first, success begets success. It all starts with one. If you have zero listings and you're brand new to the business, you want to find someone in your office who has listings and offer to work with them for a very, very tiny percentage, 10%, 15%, 20%, whatever they'll give you, free coffee as long as they let you work on it. Because after that, you will always be able to say that we just sold this house. We, you gotta be careful, don't say you, don't get in trouble, don't up ruffle feathers in the brokerage community. We just sold it with Bob, just sold it with Sally, who, whoever. Um, uh, and that's, they kind of, that's the first way you do it. And that's why teams exist. And that's why, you know, I've always had a team and why my team's so large because newer agents can come on and we can nurture them and I will, I will ruin their lives slowly, but surely. And I will really, really exhaust them, but they get to be on 10 listings really quickly and they get to run around and when they sell and I sell them, they get to say forever that those are on their resume and that they sold them. Because, and I allowed that to happen, and that's totally fine. Um, and if you have one listing, you can get another. I, that's all it takes is one. It just takes one. You just have to put the listing to work, right? From that listing, there should be another seller in the building or on the block or in the vicinity who's thinking about selling or who had previously tried selling but didn't. And maybe you have buyers from your house who've been previewing your listing or however you guys are doing it that could be good for theirs. Could you bring them by? Let's talk about the process. From there, you're meeting clients anywhere, right? And kind of setting your pipeline. I, I, I don't remember his name, but I tuned in a little bit earlier and the guy that was just talking before was just talking about planting seeds and letting them germinate, right? And that's, that's really what it's about, right? Is planting those seeds today with people that you go to the gym with, people that go to your same restaurants, friends of your kids, you know, other wives, all of these different people, you're planting those seeds all day long for yourself tomorrow. You know, in, in the book and in the course, I talk a lot about future you. Um, and it's, it's kind of this like obsession that I have with myself as an 80 year old man, because I'm, I'm, I, I'm not afraid of death. I'm, a, I'm afraid that I'm going to meet myself when I'm 80 and he's going to be disappointed that I won't have done enough when I was young and could walk and bat, my back didn't hurt and I didn't have to wear a diaper, like that I didn't do enough when I was 36, like that I didn't do enough because I had the time, right? And I could, I could stay up till two in the morning getting work done. Like I'm terrified of what that guy will do. And I'm kind of terrified that also that he might be super wealthy and successful and bent the time machine and come back and kick my ass. Like I also don't want to have to fight myself, right? In some time cop battle of the ages. So like, how do I protect my business and set myself up today and plant all those seeds so they can germinate so that 80 year old Ryan is as an amazing, amazing life. Um, Cause that's what it's all about, right? That's our, that's my, that's my role model. That's my idol. That's who I look up to. I look up to myself in the future. Like he better be awesome. And I gotta, I, I gotta make it so. Awesome. Wow. Beautiful, mate. Thank you, Mr. Bo. One of the best we've got. Now, uh, on that, Adrian brought up something that we do. We do, it's all listing centric. You know, when we hear stories, like when, when Josh, uh, I brought Josh down to Australia a couple of times, Josh Altman, yeah. and he tells us these stories of double ending uh, uh, Tyler Perry's $11 million property at 6%, three either side. We just look at that and go, no, that's impossible, you know, because it's all just about the listing side for us. Stephen right here, uh, who's just joined us. So Stephen Ryan, Ryan Stephen, is on the buyer's hey, end of things. So hey Stephen, Ryan, how are you? Throw your yeah. question. Beautiful Ryan. So yeah, many thanks for uh, having us on here today, man. Uh, amazing energy. Been following Sell It Like Sir Hunt and love the energy and the inspiration that you give to uh, to others. Um, and I asked Glenn behind the scenes. I'm like, what is Ryan like in real life? And he said he's a fucking incredible human being. Uh, charismatic, he's the same uh, in person as he is on camera. 
But my question was really, um, obviously, I'm building such an incredible team and brand that you've done. And I think you've touched on some of it with how you keep in regular touch with your, um, with your clients. But yeah. I'm interested to know how that looks in terms of staying in touch with your officers, making content. Um, obviously, you've got those three key principles. But do you feel busier now in 2020 and more in control, for example, than how you were in, um, when you were filming Million Dollar Listing? How, how is life now? Um, well, we're filming Million Dollar Listing all the time. Like we're filming today, we film, we film tomorrow, film forever. Um, uh, we're working on season nine right now. Um, but I, I, you know, I'm a better broker than I am a manager. I'm a better deal closer than I am a manager. Um, but I have people who help me with that. You know, I, I think it's important that all of us know what we're great at and what we're not great at. Like, so, and, and not try to do jobs that you're not good at and don't pretend you know how to do them. Like I can't paint a painting, so I wouldn't pretend to know how to do it. Even if someone said they'll pay me, like, God. This is not what I do. The same way, like, I don't know how to sell properties in different states. Like, people offer me listings everywhere all the time. Like, I'm sorry. I wish I could. It would be great. That looks like a big number. I would love the commission, but I don't know anything about it. You should work with a specialist. Just because I'm a brain surgeon doesn't mean I can put your shoulder back together. Mm -hmm. So, um, but between the agents and the different offices, uh, we have meetings every Monday. Um, and I'm in touch with them all the time. I would say... One of the little things that I do that I learned from somebody else who is a massive CEO uh, is I, I touch base with everyone who works with me every week, personally, in some way, shape, or form. Now, if you have a small team, that's easy because you'll probably see them and like bump into them every day. But when you have a big team in different offices, all that, it can be very easy for you to get too busy. And then you stop thinking about the people that just come to work every day and do their job and then go home. And then you're like, oh, hey, what's, haven't seen you in a bit. It's not their job to touch base with you. It's your job to make sure that they're okay working for you. And so I'll send an email to them and the subject will be like you, all caps, why are you? Body of the email will be just checking in. How you doing? How's the baby, right? Just so even if they don't respond and they do respond, but even if they wouldn't, I just want them to see that and see that I'm caring and I'm writing them something super personal. And it's, it's easy and it's simple. I could send a text message, but I like to do it by email um, just because they get it in their inbox and it's mixed up with all the other work stuff and it just be nice or it could be funny. But the capital U or hey or hi or something simple, like making sure you're okay, doing okay. You breathe in. I know you're really busy right now. You got four properties. Super simple. Move on to the next one. Those simple touch bases for anyone that's listening that's, that manages teams or different offices or trying to leverage their business, that, that, that's a... It's a little, it's a little nugget that you should all use and it's worked well for me and it's worked well for some of the biggest CEOs in the world. Fundamental because you're as, I guess you're as big as your team and the people that you support. And that's one of the things that I've noticed uh, while you've been running your show. It's, it's the yeah. respect that you give to others that um, hence the reason we've all jumped on here from Australia and across the world to support you. So I don't want to take up too much time, but I want to say, you can't ask out the universe and I was such a pleasure to meet you today and um, Thanks, I wanted to meet you and thank you for jumping on and thank you, Glenn and Naomi for putting such together an amazing event. See you, Ryan. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. You're the man. <laughs> Mate, what a champion. And Stephen, uh, if he's not already, absolutely will be. I just wanted to say uh, before, and again, I just wanted to check in. How's your timing, man? Because I know that we're coming up on an hour, man. So I want to be respectful of that. Uh, if that's, uh, you know, uh, again, I know it's late, my man, and you've had a big day. <laughs> Yeah, I've, only, I've been up since 4 a.m. So I get, wow. I, I got time for another question. Sure. Okay, cool. good. Um, this is my partner, Naomi, who brokered that deal with your team. He, she's good job, Naomi. Good head. brokering. Good deal. Thanks, thanks, Ryan. Thank you. And, and uh, I just want to say yeah. the team is awesome. So they are incredible. Good. It has Naomi, been an absolute a pleasure. You, you had a oh, question? Look, I, I, I know Ryan's got to go and I know what 4 a.m. wake-ups are like, Ryan. So I just want to take 30 seconds of your time. And I think the biggest nugget for me today to take away to bring into um, our world of coaching our guys as well is planning the deal. Like that is just mind-blowing. Like plan that deal out so you know what you're going to be telling your sellers, what you're going to be talking to your buyers at and where. I write it. I write it out. Awesome. You got it. You script it. It's a, it's script it out script. and then you can... Yeah. You can deviate, right? The same yeah. way, the same way great actors will memorize scripts and then, and then they improv because they already know what's going to happen and they know where to go from there. If you just Love wing it. a deal, 
that's how deals die. That's how deals yeah, don't screwed. get done. You don't have anything to tell the seller. You don't know what you're going to tell your client. Map it out. Yeah, Map it. it out. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. Really, really Thank you for having it. me. You guys are the best. And uh, oh, before you. you go, the uh, Big Money Energy, is that dropping soon? When's the new book? January, January. But you can pre-order now at bigmoneyenergy.com. It's book number two. I wrote it during quarantine because I just can't sit still, apparently. <laughs> really? Um, and uh, uh, yeah, it is the, it's, the, it's the secret sauce. If Sell It Like Sirhant are the ingredients to a sales career, Big Money Energy is how you put it all together and create the greatest fucking meal in the world. Like it is, Beautiful. it's the mindset. It is my mindset manifesto. It's really what it is. Cannot awesome. wait, my friend. You've been a, a wonderful addition to our industry, sir, to our little program here. And I can't wait for six more months of monthly editions of this. Oh my God. <laughs> Prepare for the Aussie influx into your program, sir. And uh, I'm certainly honored to be one of them. Thank you again, my Thanks, man. Thanks, guys. I'll Thanks, see you later. Ryan. Have a good Thank rest of your day. You. Bye. Wow. Well, there you go. I hope you liked the episode. If you liked that, then what you need to do is you need to subscribe. You need to get more of this craziness because we got more are coming. Uh, I'm never standing still and we've got so many more guests. We've got so many more strategies, more out of the box thinking. So if you haven't subscribed, literally, you're like throwing away thousands of dollars. Because I tell you, if you haven't subscribed, you don't come back. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to find you, I'm going to market to you, and I'm going to charge you for the very stuff that on this podcast we give away for free. So whack that subscribe button on whatever your favorite podcast uh, weapon of destruction is, and we'll see you on the next episode. Bye for now.